Terry Ibell is a professional fundraiser who works with nonprofit organizations, works with different charities, sometimes even churches to help them raise funds for what they are doing, the help that they're giving. And he wrote an article, kind of a humorous article, called The Worst Fundraising Ideas Ever. The Worst Fundraising Ideas Ever. This came out of meetings that he's had across the years where he would meet with a group, a charity, or some other kind of organization, and they'd sit around a table brainstorming, how can we raise some funds? What, what can we do that will be creative and innovative way to, to raise money for our organization? And he said, sometimes people come up with ideas that are just nuts, and he kind of collected some of the worst fundraising ideas. And uh, I can't repeat some of them, um, but a few of them, for example, one of them was call Bill Gates. You know, he's a rich guy, just call him up. He, I'm sure he'll give us money. Well, I'm not sure he'll answer the phone. Um, somebody said, I know, you know all those freebies that the airplane gives you on the airline, the pillow and the blanket and the headphones, we'll collect all of those used airline things and put them up on eBay. Yeah, that might raise, you know, a dollar. Um, somebody said, why don't we rent out a public pool for the night and have naked swimming night and we'll charge admission? Um, yeah, that's how you want to see your neighbors, right? Uh, that's, really, that's really what you want to do. Someone said, let's have an onion peeling competition. We'll have, get sponsors and we'll have people peel onions until they cry and we'll see who can go the longest without crying. That sounds like a riveting thing to watch, doesn't it? Just watching people peel onions. And then finally, someone says, let's have someone agree to be tasered and we'll raise $1,000 for every second that they're tasered. Um, now, you know, during vacation Bible school, I've done some pretty uh, disgusting things, you know. I've been slimed, I've been, I've been put in mud, uh, ice water, I've eaten hot peppers, I even regretfully dressed as a princess one year, but uh, I think being tased might be a little bit too far to go, even at $1,000 a second. So those are some of the bad fundraising ideas. Now, I mentioned the term fundraising because Jesus' disciples probably never really planned on being fundraisers. Paul never planned on being a fundraiser, but they discovered that the church, this new thing, this new body of Jesus had to have funds, had to have resources. We first read about in the book of Acts where the disciples are faced with a dilemma because the disciples kind of inherit new Christians and some of the people they inherited in the church were poor widows. And these poor widows well, the Jews had sort of a support system where they would collect money and food for poor widows because they couldn't work, they couldn't support themselves. Well, some of these widows became Christians. And when they became Christians, the Jewish community just cut them off totally. Cut them off from any help, any aid, any food. And suddenly, now they were the church's responsibility. And the church had to suddenly come up with a plan to help all these new poor Christian widows. And the disciples were trying to do it on their own. They were trying to raise the money, collect the food, help the poor widows. And the disciples went, we can't do this by ourselves. We got too much other things to do, like preach. And so they recruited the first church committee, uh, a group of seven men that they called the deacons that took over this new job of fundraising so that they could feed the poor widows. It was the first time the church really had to come up with a, a plan to raise funds. Now, Paul also didn't plan on having to raise money or, or raise funds. Paul, when he was on his way to Damascus with the idea of persecuting Christians, arresting them, of course, he meets Jesus on the road. And Jesus reveals himself to Paul, and Paul has a new turnaround. And, and Paul's new mission in life is not to persecute Christians, but to, to make Christians, to spread the word, to preach the gospel so specifically to Gentiles, to non-Jews. And so Paul becomes this apostle to the Gentiles. He goes from town to town preaching and planting new churches in all these Gentile communities. But then Paul became aware of a problem. Back in Jerusalem at the, the mother church, 
which was primarily Jewish Christians, they were starving. They were in dire straits because they'd been cut off by the Jewish community. Once they became followers of Jesus, their fellow Jews wouldn't do business with them, wouldn't hire them, wouldn't work with them, wouldn't help them, wouldn't associate with them. And because of that, they were homeless and jobless and and many of them hungry. And so Paul realized they needed help. And the idea was that they would collect funds from the Gentile congregations all throughout the Roman Empire and send some of that money back to Jerusalem to help their struggling Jewish Christian brothers. And so Paul became involved in a, well, an effort to raise funds in a, in a stewardship campaign. And that's, the, that's what was happening in the passage that Emily read for us a moment ago. It's Paul talking about this stewardship effort that he's trying to raise funds from all these Gentile congregations, these non-Jewish Christians, to help their Jewish Christian brothers and sisters back in the, in the Jerusalem church. And he talks about how their willingness in Corinth to be involved has been an inspiration to other churches. He says in 2 Corinthians 9, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem, for I know how eager you are to help, and I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. He says to the Corinthian church there in Greece, it was your willingness to step up. It was your willingness to give that's made some of these other churches, like those in Macedonia, also be willing to step up and help our Jewish sisters and brothers back in Jerusalem. Now, he he goes on, and this is the passage we read a moment ago, about the joy of giving, the, the benefits of giving. Now, when I said the apostles didn't really sign up to be fundraisers, and Paul didn't really ever imagine himself a fundraiser, I mean, I'm in the same boat. I, I didn't think this would be a part of what I would do. When I was first called, felt God calling me to consider being a pastor, going into full-time Christian ministry, the last thing I ever thought about was ever having to raise money. Matter of fact, when I started seminary, it had never crossed my mind that that was part of what a church needs to do, was, was raise funds. I, I'd, I guess I'd been in church when the pastor had talked about those things, but it had gone right over my head. I didn't realize that a church has to raise money. But as I went through seminary, and especially once I actually became a pastor, I realized, yeah, we as a church have to continually emphasize giving. Now, it was kind of like, oh, I don't think I want to talk about that. But the more I read the Bible, the more I realized, well, Jesus talked about it a lot. Jesus talked about money all the time. A third of Jesus' parables are about money. Why? Because money is real life. And the Bible's about real life. The Bible's not just about heaven. The Bible's not just about things way down in the future after we die. The Bible's about the here and now. Jesus' teachings are about how to live here and now in real life. And part of real life is, is money. Part of real life is how do we gain money? What do we do with it? Um, how do we spend it? How do we give it? it? It's about real life. And so Jesus talked about it because it's part of our daily lives. And the church began to realize this is going to be a part of what we're going to have to do to make this thing called the church live and grow. You know, and Paul says in those verses we read earlier, that this is not a burden, this is not just a, okay, this is a joy. This, this is a privilege. This is, this is something that is too wonderful for words. That this is how many good things happen when we are generous. How many good things happen when we give. He said there, two good things happen, in verse 12, two good things happen will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So when we give, people get help. When we give, needs are met. And just like in those days, needs were met, when we give, needs are met. Now, when we give, all kinds of needs are met. The needs of of kids, of children are met. Kids need to know Jesus. Children need to know that they were made by God, loved by God, Precious to God. Children need to know 
who Jesus is and that Jesus loves them. Children need to be introduced to Christ and to God. And so we do that in Sunday school and in vacation Bible school and in kids camps and in all kinds of other ways. Young people, middle school students, high school students, college students need to know that they are in a time of life where they're making the most important decisions they'll make, the direction of your life. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to, who are you going to serve in your life? What's going to be the, the priority of your life? And so young people need to know what God is calling them to do and be. And so we have Sunday school and mission trips and camps and weekly youth worship and on and on and on. Adults need to know that there's a God who loves them and who's willing to give them direction. Adults need to worship and learn and grow in their discipleship and know how to serve and know where to serve. And so we provide those opportunities. When we give, needs are met. And Paul says another bonus of that is people are thankful. People express joyful appreciation to God. You know, people tell me all the time, They don't know how they would make it in life without the church. Often, when I'm preparing to do a a funeral or a memorial service, a family will tell me, I don't know how people survive without the church. I don't know how people make it through tough times without the church. I don't know how people navigate the challenges of life without the church. And they express just how important the church is. Some of the videos we've seen over the last month are Households and families in our congregation saying that same thing. This is what the church means to me. This is what it does for me. Paul says that the people that are helped by the church will will pray for us. He says in 2 Corinthians 9.14, talking about these Jerusalem Christians, they'll pray for you with deep affection because of your overflowing grace that God has given to you. Now, having said all that, the verse I really want us to think about for a minute is verses 10 and 11. Or here Paul says, God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. Now here's where some preachers, especially the ones on TV especially the ones who have helmet hair, um, go off the rails because they take verses like this and they say things like, if you'll give to this ministry of ours so we can buy this jet airplane, then God will make you rich. That's what some of the TV prosperity preachers, how they take verses like this and twist them around to being, if you'll support their TV ministry and keep them on the air and buy them big mansions and cars and jet airplanes, then God will do the same and make you rich and you can have your own big car and your own airplane and your own mansion. They make it all about financial prosperity. God's going to make you prosperous if you give to that particular ministry. Now, that's, there's a word for that, but I can't use it in church. It's not one I use anyway. But another word for that is blasphemy. It's taking Scripture and just intentionally misrepresenting it. Nowhere does the Bible say that we will become wealthy people if we follow Jesus. Nowhere does the Bible say that if we follow Jesus, we'll become financially rich people. What it does say is that God will meet our needs God will give us resources so that we can be generous. That's what it says in the scriptures we just read. You'll be enriched every way so that you can always be generous. Now, does following Jesus sometimes lead to financial well-being? Well, yeah, you know, because the more you become like Christ, well, often the better employee you are, the better worker you are, the better boss you are. Think about John Wesley. When John Wesley started preaching, most of the people who were flocking to hear Wesley preach were the poor people, the sort of the lower class people of England who weren't really welcome in the Church of England. And they became Methodists, and they started to move up economically into the middle class. Now, how did that happen? How did those people move up economically? Well, they stopped gambling. They stopped going to the bars every night. And because they weren't going to the bars every night, they started showing up for work every morning. 
They became more honest and more trustworthy and more dependable. They became nicer and kinder and gentler and more responsible. They became better husbands and better wives and better parents and better neighbors. And all of that had the impact of they started to be more successful in their careers because their lives were straightening up and they were getting rid of some of the vices that held them down. They were becoming more responsible because Christ was teaching them how to live a better life. And so, yes, there was some natural increase in their economic situation, more opportunities. But it wasn't because, well, I follow Jesus and God's going to just dump a lot of money on me. It's because the more we follow Jesus, really, the better we become in so many ways, including as workers, as bosses, as entrepreneurs. It's sort of a natural response. But according to Paul, it's not the best reason to be generous. The best reason to be generous is because of what it does to help God's people and how God's people will then offer praise and thanksgiving back to God and pray for us, for our willingness to be generous, to be givers. There was a name you may not have ever heard. Let me pull out my high school and college French here. Marie-Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert de Montier, um, better known as the Marquis de Lafayette. Now that, you may be, you may remember the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, if you remember from the story of the American Revolution. The Marquis de Lafayette was also called the hero of two worlds. Lafayette was a French aristocrat, and he was so impressed with the Declaration of Independence among the American colonies, so impressed with what Jefferson wrote there in the Declaration of Independence, that Lafayette came from France to America came to George Washington and made himself available as a leader of troops, as a commander. And Washington gave Lafayette command over some of the revolutionary American forces. He led many into battle. He was successful as a field commander. And after America won, well, with also, he also lobbied the French government to send financial aid to the American revolutionaries. And after all of that, He returned to France. He actually was one of the authors of the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which was analogous to our Declaration of Independence. He wrote it with the help of Thomas Jefferson. So that's why he's called the Hero of Two Worlds. Well, after the American Revolution, he returns to France. He's an aristocrat. He has large farms. He has large estates where he raises crops, especially wheat. Well... In in 1783, there was a disastrous wheat harvest. Um, Most of the farms didn't produce any wheat. But his, his did. He was spared this disaster. But many were suffering because the wheat harvest was so poor. Many farmers were going out of business. Many peasants didn't have any food. But his farms were doing well. And as a result of that, one of Lafayette's workers came to him and said, We have all this wheat, and all the other farms haven't, and the price is going to rise. The bad harvest has raised the prices. Now is the time to sell. In other words, now is the time to take advantage of all the other people's misery and make a huge profit because we have the wheat. And Lafayette thought about the hungry peasants, thought about the other farmers who were growing broke, and said, no, this is not the time to sell. This is the time to give. And instead of making enormous profits, he started to give wheat away to people who were hungry. One other reason he was called the hero of two worlds. Now is the time to give, he said. You know, this time of year, we think of as the season of giving. Um, We celebrate in about a week and a half Thanksgiving where we thank God for all that He has given us, and then, even now, shopping for Christmas. But you know, I've discovered, most of us, when we become adults at least, we get more joy from giving than receiving. Think about it. I know when you're a kid, you're thinking, oh, all, all my presents, and that's, that's natural, that's okay. But the older we get, the more pleasure we get out of thinking, what can I give that will really excite somebody, one of my family or friends? What can I give that will bring a big smile of excitement? We, 
We get more pleasure out of giving at Christmas than we even get from receiving. You know, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And he wasn't just saying something that sounds good, but no, it's true. We get a thrill. We get a joy out of giving. That's why when Paul writes about it here and talks about this offering that they're going to collect to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem, he doesn't make it sound like, well, now come on, everybody, pony up, let's get it done. No, he says, what a great joy this is. What, what a great blessing this is. He says, this is a gift too wonderful for words. He's excited about the privilege that they have of helping their sisters and brothers. He's excited by how the Corinthian people have stepped up already and how their enthusiasm for giving has been infectious to the other churches. You know, it's not something that we kind of have to do. It's something we get to do. It's a blessing. There are people in this world who don't have the blessing we have of being able to give. We are so blessed that we are in a position to be generous and to to feel the blessing of being able to be generous. And that's why once a year we have a Sunday like this where we celebrate generosity, where we celebrate stewardship, where we've asked people to, over the last couple of weeks, read some of the brochures that we prepared, take that commitment card, talk about it, pray about it, fill it out, and then... This day, bring it up, and we're going to lay it here on the communion rail in a minute. And if right now you're going, it's on the kitchen table. Uh, I forgot it. Uh, if you remember the number you put on it, there are commitment cards and envelopes in front of you. And it would really help us out if instead of waiting for you to get it off the kitchen table, just take one of those cards out of the pew rack and fill it out the way you filled out the one back home and, and bring it up. Because... Uh, we don't make a budget until we get all these back, and, and that sometimes takes a while. Not everybody's here today, um, but the more we can get in and the quicker we get them in, the more we can make plans for 2020. We're entering this new decade. We're entering this new year, and um, you know, every year that I've been pastor here, uh, we have um, we've done an amazing job of stepping up, and often new people uh, stepping up long-time members stepping up. It it is a beautiful thing to see. And so I'm going to pray, and then uh, as some music plays, we're going to invite, if you've got that card, uh, to come up and lay it on uh, our communion rail. Let's pray together.